started. We'll do like a slow introduction in case there's any, any stragglers here. But um, my name is Jake and I am here representing Island Heritage Trust. We're so excited to work alongside Blue Hill Heritage Trust uh, to bring you this webinar series. We're gonna go strong through, at least through the month of June. And we're really excited to bring this to you every Thursday at four o'clock. So I'm co-hosting here with Lander and we'll be monitoring the chat box down at the bottom. I believe everyone's setup is probably the same and you can see the chat. Um, feel free to, you know, drop a line there. We're gonna save the Q&A for like the last 10 minute portion of the presentation. And with that, I'll let Lander introduce our wonderful presenters. Thank you so much, Jake. So this is very exciting for us because this week we have three panelists who are going to be sharing the presentation. So welcome all of you and thank you so much for being with us. We're super excited to have you. So we have um, Chris DeVore and he is a wildlife biologist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service main field office. And his work focuses primarily on projects involving federally threatened and endangered species in the state, but he also occasionally sneaks in some outreach time, like this evening. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Uh, we also have Siona Olbrook, and she is a member of the field staff at Maine Coast Heritage Trust. She primarily works on conservation projects with landowners, other land trusts, and government entities. And in recent years, this has included serving as the lead point person on a number of alewife restoration projects around the Bagaduce River. Thank you so much for being here, Siona. And then we also have Alex Dranga, is a um, directorate fellow with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And he has worked on outreach and educational programming for the National Wildlife Refuges in, in New England, while spending time on projects involving federally threatened and endangered species. So we have quite the crowd here today with so much expertise and knowledge and Welcome, thank you for being here, and I'll pass it over to all of you. Cool, well, I'm gonna start us off today. Uh, thanks for having us, and thanks for joining us here today. I think uh, it's fun to see the number of people that we have to talk about anadromous fish. So uh, I, as Lander said, I work for the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and I am an endangered species biologist. And Lander and I were chatting maybe two or three weeks ago and we were trying to figure out, you know, we want to put a webinar together and what to chat about. And this time of year with all the salmon runs and the alewife runs and all the fish returning, we thought it would be great to talk about anadromous fish. And so I know a couple of fish species around here, especially the endangered species, threatened and endangered species, but I'm pretty lucky that I was able to recruit Cy and Alex here who are able to help me out on some of the other ones. And uh, so I was able to rope them in. So we'll jump into the presentation. I'm gonna try and share my screen to get it started. So. Let me know how this works. I know our, looks like the majority of the crowd is muted, but I know our panel can still chat here. So let me know if you can see this. Good to go? Looks great, Chris. Good to know. Okay, so yeah, so as I said, uh, Christopher, Cy, and Alex, we're gonna be chatting about anadromous fish around here. So as we jump into it, we'll first talk about what anadromous fish are. It's kind of a big word, but it's a very simple concept. Uh, we'll chat about what species are here in Maine and which ones are around the peninsula specifically. And then we're gonna dig into three species in particular. We're gonna talk about their life cycle biology, where we can find them around here, how we can help them, and just some of the projects that we've been a part of around here on the peninsula and throughout the state. Uh, but throughout, I'm gonna make sure that my chat box is open, and hopefully you guys do as well. We're gonna have some fun. So Lander and I thought it'd be fun to make this a little more interactive. So we're gonna have questions throughout. Uh, the questions are gonna be, some of them are easier than others. Uh, but we're gonna have questions throughout that are, it's gonna be trivia style. So we'll get right into it pretty quickly, test it out with one question. So we'll ask a question, you will type your answer in the chat box, and, but do not submit it until I say submit. So some of them might be, you know, give you 30 seconds, some of them might give you a minute, but we'll just kind of have some fun and keep it interactive. So we, I will open up my chat box here. 
get us started. All right, so what are anadromous fish? So anadromous fish are fish that spend the majority of their life out at sea, but they're born and they reproduce in fresh water. So we have a number of species here in the, in the state that are anadromous fish. Uh, they're really cool. They're a unique class of fish that go through a physical transformation to be able to handle fresh water and then hang out in brackish water for a number of weeks. And this process in salmon and some other fish, it's known as smultification. And they're, so they go through this process and then they end up out at sea for a number of years. They go, come back, go through the same process of these, this physical change to then go back up in the freshwater and reproduce. So that is what anadromous fish are. And we'll start off strong with a question with a lot of potential answers. Uh, what native anadromous fish species can you think of here in the state of Maine? And so I'll give you guys, this is the longest one by far. Uh, we're going for a total of 11. So I think we'll go for like a minute here and try and answer in the chat box. Do not hit submit until we say go. So I will tell the other panelists, I'm trying to pull up my chat box and it's not working. I don't know if your guys' chat box is up. Yes, um, so I can okay. see mine, Chris. And so guys... far, let's see, we have eels as an answer. Or should, should, should I have not have said that? We do have <laughs> well, people submitting. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. So from here on out, we'll hold off on these. But yeah, so the idea is that we'll type them all in if possible and then we'll uh, let them go. But I'll give a couple of hints just to keep this rolling. A couple are sport fish, uh, a couple are endangered. I'm trying to think, uh, if you imagine, you know, you hear your, your buddies going out around here in some of the streams to go for some of these fish. Out in, in the Bagadoos, there's a lot of these where I think about around here. But uh, yeah, we'll hit submit and see how many you guys can get. I will continue on the presentation. Here's our list of anadromous fish species here in Maine. So we have the alewife, which uh, Sai is gonna jump into for us. We have shad, the salmon, which I'm gonna talk about a little more later. The Atlantic sturgeon, the tomcod. Herring, brook trout, which Alex is gonna get into. The smelt, the uh, sea lamprey, which is a strange little creature. And uh, the short-nosed sturgeon and the striped bass. So, if you want an image of what, ooh, actually, I will get into, I'll, I'll show those off shortly, but we'll try out another quick question. Um, so one of these fish that I'm gonna be talking about and showing an image shortly does it in reverse. So it's the only one in the state that does the process backwards. So actually they are, they lay eggs at sea, they, they come up and they live the majority of their life in freshwater, and then they end up going back, migrating back out to sea to reproduce. And so one question is, what is that? And you might know, because it's pretty relevant this time of year. And then the other question is, do you know what the process is called? So we'll give this 20, 30 seconds. Wayne got it correct. Did we, get a, did we get a chat box answer? Yeah, we did. Nice. OK, well, if it's in there, yep. So the answer to that one is eels, and it's catadromous. So American eels, they do the whole process in reverse. They actually go, uh, they're born out in the Sargasso Sea, out in the Caribbean. It's kind of a mystery of where exactly, but uh, so in that region, and they come all the way back here to live their adult life and then return. So cool species. So here's a list, or here's a list picture of uh, all the species. So the big one that you see that's taken up the majority of space is the Atlantic salmon, or sorry, the Atlantic sturgeon. And on uh, the bottom right, you can see the short-nosed sturgeon. They are huge, huge fish. Uh, the Atlantic sturgeon can get up to 16 feet long, up to 800 pounds. So it's a huge migratory fish. If you can imagine these jumping around in the Kennebec or the Penobscot. Uh, both the sturgeon are endangered species. Um, then yeah, this is a two-scale image. We actually have this up in the Craigbrook Visitor Center. So this is two-scale. You can see the salmon right behind the sturgeon there just to kind of give you an idea. So jumping into that, we're gonna focus on three of them in particular. We're gonna chat about alewife, starting with alewife, then we're gonna talk about sea run brookies, 
And then we're going to talk about Atlantic salmon last. So I, from here, I'm going to pass it off. I believe Sai is muted. How about that? Good to go. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you, Chris. And I'm Siona. And unlike Alex and Chris, I'm not a biologist. So if you get into really specific questions, I'm going to need their help. Uh, but in the meantime, um, in working on land conservation projects recently, I've been working on a number around this fish, which is alewife, or Alosa pseudoharengus. Um, and I'll pause on that name for a second just to say I looked around to see where the name alewife comes from, and there are a lot of theories, some involving beer. Um, but the Latin name comes from Old French for a type of shad, because they are related to shad. So alewife are members of the river herring family, cousins of blueback herring. A lot of you put that in the chat box as an answer. They're about 10 to 14 inches in length. They have a single black spot behind their eye and they have a forked tail. And this time of year, in this hemisphere anyway, uh, tens of thousands of these fish are running up the streams from the sea, climbing into ponds to spawn. And What's pretty amazing to me about these fish is that they are guided by a sense of smell to home rivers. In other words, they go back to the stream or the river where they were born. So migrating females that we're seeing these days are usually four to five years old, and males are sometimes a little younger. And just because it's amazing to think about, one of these females can produce 60 to 100,000 eggs but only a few survive. Um, some adults die after spawning, but most of them will swim back out and out as far as 120 miles out. So this little fish has big impact. It's everybody's lunch. They are food for wildlife in air. They're for, uh, food for seabirds, bald eagles, osprey. On land, they're food for fox, raccoon, skunk, weasel. In freshwater, they're food for bass, trout, pickerel, and they're fed on by striped bass, cod, haddock, bluefish. And on this next slide that you see in front of you right now, they're also food for people and have been for thousands of years. They were an important food for the Wabanaki here in Maine and for European settlers, and more recently, even in living memory, um, people canned, salted, and smoke alewife around here for eating. This left image is from the smoker truck of the Downey Salmon Federation that came to alewife day last year. So this is smoked, I think it's actually mackerel, but they did offer smoke um, alewife and mackerel last year. And some of you might remember Willard Kane of Surrey or have heard of him. He had a store on Main Street and he used to have a prized collection that he would offer of these smoked alewife each year. Alewife were also a traditional spring bait for lobstermen, and the recovery of ground fisheries like cod in Maine uh, need alewife in the food chain. Next slide, please. So, as I said, yeah, thank you, Susan. The story is where Pugnuts is now. <laughs> that's right. Um, this slide looks like a whole bunch of dots. I'm sorry, that's a little blurrier than I hoped, but. This is an image of the uh, around 1,000 dams that now exist in Maine on the streams. So alewife were so central to the web of life in Maine and abounded in the ponds and streams around Maine. And this is what the streams and ponds look like now. This is dams and road crossings and is a major reason why the alewife populations have plummeted in the last two centuries. The streams were blocked by sawmills, woolen mills, grist mills that were key to the existence around here, the economy, and were jobs for generations past, um, as recently as in the 60s, there are some around here. 
There was also a lot of water control structures put down for haying and pasturing. Can I have the next slide, Chris? So to show you some local examples of the type of water control structures that got in the way of ill-wife populations, on the left, you're looking at the mill at White's, that was at White's Pond in Penobscot called Condon's Saw Mill. And on the right is a water control structure that was used around pasturing activities. That's in the flowage downstream of Parker Pond. So it's on uh, Blue Hill Heritage Trust's car property that they own. And in some ways, this area lost the connection to these fish when the mills were built because the fish sort of couldn't get up anymore and became a bit more forgotten. And the, we now have a daunting task uh, statewide of trying to restore this fishery one stream at a time. Next slide. So a recent example of this, some of you will know, uh, is in Surrey, not far from um, Pugnuts and the, the former Willard Keynes store. Um, this is Patton Stream that's just below Main Street. You run right over it as you drive towards Ellsworth. And after a lot of years of meetings and work and a lot of local volunteers who put in time and effort, um, this run was reopened in 2016 which restored access to over 1,100 acres of illwife habitat. Next slide. And there's another local set of projects happening now that some of you know about, and that's around the Bagaduce River watershed. This map shows the watershed around the river and shows the location of the five projects that are underway which if all comes together, uh, will be finished by the end of next year. So our goal is by the end of 2021. Next slide. And to give you a sense of these three projects that are left to be done this year and next, this is an image of um, Snow's Brook, which runs out of Frost Pond, comes out under Caterpillar Hill Road in Sedgwick. A couple of you might have seen an article in the packet recently on this project. Um, this is a project like the Patton Stream situation where there's a, essentially a hung culvert or a culvert that sits too high and at a wrong angle under a roadway. You can see it on the left that blocks fish passage up to this entire subwatershed. So the project we hope to do with a lot of steps still to go is to create something like the example on the right here which allows fish passage, but is under a roadway as well. Next slide. I thought we would take a look briefly at um, an ongoing project sort of from start to finish to give a sense of it. So we are looking right now from uh, on high on a drone uh, down at the outlet of Pierce Pond over in Penobscot on the Pierce Pond Road, some of you will know with the Bagaduce River in the background there and the ocean beyond, just to give you a sense of that watershed. Um, this is about a 110 acre pond with a half a mile stream up to it. And a few decades ago, it had a 90 foot long dam put into it at its outlet and five mills were run by the stream here, which is a pretty short stretch of stream. So this was an early project that we completed already. We worked closely with the town and a lot of people in the community were so key to this. Next slide. And one of the points I want to make with this next image uh, is that these are, there we go. These are real construction projects with big equipment. And um, the end is nat natural looking, but this is a number of weeks of moving big rocks and uh, keeping water out of a stream and using dump trucks and bulldozers to make these happen. Next slide, Chris. And on our next slide, we're gonna see what this spot looks like complete. This is what this looks like today. And this is an example of what's called a nature-like fishway. So where you saw all those trucks and bulldozers dealing with 
um, this old dam that needed a lot of repairs and changes to it. We tried to make it as natural looking um, with a lot of engineering that goes into designing these pools and the sort of steps in between them, which are designed to keep the water levels of the pond relatively the same as before, but allow the fish to come in and out when they need to. And these are really carefully engineered to allow a number of species, not just alewife, to run up and down. They have specific distances and heights and the resting pools are specific. So a lot of engineering goes into these nature lake fish weights. Next slide. And part of our goal with this is not just the actual construction on the ground, but it's also to build in some awareness raising, some education, some outreach aimed at all ages. Because as I said earlier, we've all lost connection to these fish um, and not paid as much attention to their need for passage. It's one thing to restore these fish and their passage to the habitat on the ground. But in order for this to last, we need to help people know about this, care about it, and keep this passage over time. So this is a sign that you see looking out at Pierce Pond. This is that same project from the little public spot that we have around the fishway now. Next slide. So hopefully you've seen some of these bumper stickers around on cars. This is our effort as part of that sort of reconnection of people to the fish. We're trying to create a school of alewife on bumpers. And that is to sort of build the interest and support and awareness around this fish and the need for their passage. And interestingly, this is part of a global effort. This feels very local, but in fact, there's a global effort underway these days. There's something called World Fish Migration Day, which is global. There's a, um, this year, it's a, I think it's a 24-hour webinar. Uh, usually, it's a series of events all around the world around fish passage. Um, we also, in the last couple of years, have had celebrations that we call Alewife Day. Uh, this year, we're actually going to be turning it into a webinar for schools. But last year, we had about 300 people come. Chris was there um, and Lander. So that was a fun sort of celebration of this fish. And next slide. And this is our goal. This is a picture of the alewife swimming up into Pierce Pond last year. And um, as you see on some of the stickers on the cars, we want billions of these fish in the food chain helping to be part of the ecology around us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex to talk about other anadromous fish. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, my name is Alex Strenga, and I want to first thank the participants for spending their afternoon with us, um, and Lander and Jacob, Sai and Chris for having me. Um, so first off, a brief background on anadromous brook trout. Uh, I think it's important to note that brook trout can inhibit a wide range of waters, so anywhere from large lakes to tiny mountain streams, uh, but the key to their survival is cold and clean water, much like most fish uh, that we have in Maine. Um, the size and the longevity of their lives, um, the, the feeding habit or habits of the trout depend on the elevation, what they have for forage, and the water temperature. Um, brookies that live in small streams, they rarely live longer than five years. So in a lot of the small streams around here, um, you won't find them much older than five. And they're generally under 12 inches. Um, they feed on aquatic insects, streams like um, the upper area of Patton and the upper area of Peters Brook. Uh, those would be good places to find the small brook trout. Um, but Brookies in large lakes, they can grow uh, in rivers along the coast, can grow to be almost 10 pounds, which is pretty impressive for a fish um, that can only be 12 inches sometimes. But 10 pounds is, a, is definitely an anomaly in Maine. We get some that are around seven or so in our bigger lakes like Moosehead. Um, and they feed on insects and larger prey like minnows, um, mice even and they can live up to, up to 10 years. Uh, 
Chris, if you don't mind going to the next slide, that'd be great. So brook trout, both the lake and stream populations, um, they spawn in the fall. And spawning is activated by the water temperature when it falls to be about 52 degrees. The picture, the top picture is a picture of a female making a red with her tail. Uh, it's very similar to what salmon do when they come back from the ocean. Um, and the picture below, the gentleman has it, a male. And you can notice it's a male because of the bright red belly of the fish and the kite uh, along its jaw. So a little bit more aggressive looking. Um, I think it's a really beautiful fish, actually, if you ask me. Um, so usually we don't allow fishermen to target these trout during their spawning season. So the fishing season is shut off for the fall, you know, late fall, so they can spawn. And, um, then ice fishing starts after afterwards. So Maine supports the largest distribution uh, and abundance of native trout in the United States. Uh, more than 1,200 lakes and ponds are managed by the state for brook trout, and 60% of those are sustained by natural reproduction. Um, some brook trout that spend a part of their life in salt water are called salters or sea runs, and that's kind of what I'm going to focus on here. I want to give you a little background on what brook trout are. Um, historically, anywhere out along the coast of New England, there would be a possibility of salters, but they must compete with one of the high, most highly modified and densely populated coastlines in the world. If you think about the coast, especially from like Portland, Maine down to Boston, um, there's not a whole lot of room for them anymore. So um, that's one of the main challenges for this species. Uh, the unique markings of a brook trout are unmistakable. Uh, a tiger stripe like back. They have olive colored sides with small scattered red dots. Uh, and the red dots are haloed in a pale blue color. Um, the white tip fit, uh, pectoral fins have a black line that transitioned to the orange and red on that male. Um, like I said, you know, in my opinion, their markings are one of the most interestingly aesthetic fish that we have in New England for sure. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the question. All right. So what color belly does a male brook trout have? You just saw one. That's my hint. All right, Chris, you can go to the next slide. Sounds like pretty much almost everybody is getting it here, which is good. So the historical range of brook trout, I, on this slide, I um, borrowed some information from Trout Unlimited and the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, which I'll speak on a, li a little bit later here. Um, so on the left is the historic range of brook trout. So it's pretty cool. You can find them all the way down in Atlanta, or yeah, in Georgia, close to Atlanta, um, in the upper Appalachian Mountain range. And the further north they go, the wider they're dispersed because of water temperature and whatnot. Um, so they're the only native tr species east of the Rocky Mountains. And uh, what else? the further north, like I said, the wider the population stretches. But in Maine, in New England especially, it extends to the coast. Um, so this native range extends west to the Hudson Bay and Great Lakes where they're found as well. Um, and they can get rather large in the Great Lakes as well. Um, they're found in big numbers in northern Canada. If you go to Labrador or uh, Newfoundland, that's, it's a serious sport fish up there. Um, and that's where you can get your 10 pound brook trout. And people will go up there and spend big money to go on these fishing trips. Um, so a general rule for brook trout is the farther north you go, or the larger the water body in which the trout reside, the larger the trout can get and the longer that they will live. So earlier when I said, remember cold and clear water. So it kind of goes along with that. Chris, can you please go to the next slide? So what's the difference between sea run brook trout and normal brook trout? Um, the reason that we're talking about brook trout is because of their migration to the sea. Uh, so they are anadromous fish at times, 
So I'll just recap what Chris said. They are fish that are born in fresh water, then migrate to the ocean as juveniles, and the, they grow into adults, and they come back to spawn. Um, pot and, pot and modromous fish are born in upstream freshwater habitats that migrate downstream, and they're still in freshwater. Uh, as juveniles to grow into adults before migrating back upstream to spawn. So this happens in a lot of our big reservoirs that have brooks um, and even some of our smaller ponds. You know, if you get up to like Baxter or um, KI area, you'll find ponds that have that type of thing. Uh, another word for that is adfluvial. So those are fish that migrate between lakes or rivers or streams um, or resident. You know, we have resident brook trout too. It's kind of like a landlocked version of a brook trout. So think about a small stream that might have um, a natural barrier like a beaver dam or something of that sense. Um, and they can't really get anywhere. So those are resident populations and they generally don't get very big. Or like I said, in a smaller pond up north, there might be, you know, um, a resident population of native brook trout in the smaller ponds. So the thing that I find so fascinating about the brook trout is that they can fall into any of these categories. Um, the different types of these brook trout speaks to their resilience. Um, you know, there's a reason why they've been around for such a long time. Um, I think it's also important to note that these fish can be a good bioindicator species, especially the salters along the coast. Um, you know, generally, if you have them, then you have a pretty decent uh, water quality and a good uh, habitat. And also the salters are genetically superior to resident brook trout. Uh, and that's mainly because of what they endure in the marine environment. If you think about, you know, all the um, competition out in those waters, the further down the, uh, the, sh the brooks they go, the more species there are, so there's more competition. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Chris, that'd be great. So more about the difference, right? It's where they live. Um, so we have a couple pictures here, picture of Petersbrook and Patton Stream in the spring, the water flowing up hard. Um, Stanley Brook in Seal Harbor, you know, that one goes right into the beach there. Uh, picture of Moosehead Lake in, up in Greenville. That's where we have some of our biggest brook trout in the state. And Wells Estuary in Wells, Maine, there, it's a national estuarine reserve. Um, there's been known to be some down there. So if we think about our sea runs, right, we, in order for a brookie to be a salter, it must have connectivity to a sea. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's an obvious point. So although some of the moosehead um, trout can get rather large, they actually um, might not be as genetically diverse as the ones that we find in our smaller streams because um, they're kind of stuck there. Uh, so Chris, can you go to the next one, please? Sorry, Chris, did you? Yeah, okay, great. So another thing, it's how they look, right? So um, the top pictures are fresh sea run brook trout. They have a little bit more of a silver sheen to them, and that's due to what they are uh, foraging for, and also that they've been spending time in salt water. Um, and then the pictures of the trout are on the bottom. Those are our resident brook trout, or a trout that's come back from the sea and has spent some time back in uh, brooks or lakes. So they end up coming back to streams and rivers with the silver sheen. Um, and the, the diet out in the the ocean or the estuary is usually shrimp or minnows, um, even small crabs or small alewives. And once they return to the brooks, uh, traditional diets in the tannin color water quickly transforms these fish to look like most brook trout. So this is similar to all anadromous fish like salmon or steelhead, just a little less brilliant. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with steelhead um, that you can get out in the Great Lakes, but even there, they come back in a brilliant silver sheen. So it's not really the salt water that gets them. Um, it's more of the forage and uh, coming back into tanning colored water in the brooks. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And finally, um, I kind of 
keyed in on it in the last slide, but it's what they eat. So uh, like we discussed earlier, depending on the size, the type and habitat of the brookies, they eat different things. It's whatever is available to them. Um, and brookies are very opportunistic. So in a area like Moosehead Lake, they're gonna forage for crawfish, uh, even mice, which I think some people would be like, wow, that's crazy. But um, there's a lot of people that have caught brook trout and you're interested in what they eat, if you're gonna keep them. So you open them up and you look in their stomachs and you find mice. Um, and then also in the smaller areas, you know, the mayflies, um, insect nymphs, um, and even river herring, you know, an alewife, a smaller alewife will be uh, prey for a, a larger sea run brook trout. Um, next slide, please. Oh, we have a question. Great. So true or false, a catadromous fish is born in salt water, migrates to fresh water to grow into an adult, then back into the ocean to spawn. Hence, these fish are not related to cats. An American eel is a catadromous fish. And you already had this question. <laughs> All right, Chris, you can go on, please. So the status and strategy. Um, the waters that support these brook trout, much similar to um, salmon and our alewife, they were dammed, deforested, filled with silt. Um, these problems further compounded by poor agricultural practices, um, road building, mine runoff, acid precipitation, uh, introduction of exotic species like brown trout and uh, rainbow trout, um, logging even too up north. Uh, so overfishing has also been an issue, depending on uh, who you ask, I guess would be the way that goes. Um, but they're easy to target along the coast, so this specific type of brook trout um, can be overfished pretty quickly. Um, so only in rec recent decades have serious efforts begun to conserve and restore these fisheries. Hundreds of thousands of brook trout have been stocked and several organizations are focused on preserving salter habitat in Massachusetts and Maine. Um, according to the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, um, that's a consortium of public and private entities fighting to save these trout. The species has been extirpated from about 90% of its original range. And again, think about you know the amount of uh, build up on the coast and especially from Portland to Boston. Um, next slide, please. So the status and strategy, well, the strategy of this is, you know, what is being done? Um, so there are some groups that are interested in researching um, salters. So like Trout Unlimited, the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, Native Fish Collation, Sea Run Brook Trout Collation, uh, there are many more. So some of these projects need more data and citizen scientists. Um, when to find uh, if salters are migrating back and forth to brooks can be day to day and they might only hang out in that area for a day. So it's, it's important to have more boots on the ground, I guess. Um, so if you are interested in helping out, you know, try to contact one of the, those groups. Uh, and what you can't really go wrong, you get to spend out time outdoors, you can fish. Um, you know, hopefully you end up catching one and they're really interesting. Um, and the question I guess is, you know, why protect them? And I think it's just as important as protecting any other sea run fish at this point. Um, and they're so pretty, so I don't see why you wouldn't want to, right? Um, also they are up against a lot of things. So the ocean's a scary place if, when you're a brook trout. You know, you have striped bass, seals, birds, and other predators cruising these estuaries looking for a meal. Um, th further away from their spawning habitat or home brooks, the more biodiversity they ha encounter. So this includes not only greater foraging opportunities so they can grow bigger, but greater opportunities for them be to become prey of a bigger animal. Um, next slide, please. So the myth and the mystery of these fish. Uh, so there's a lot that's not known about these, you know, like one, I guess an example would be when a sea run brook trout 
comes back into uh, you know its home waters, is it gonna mate only with another sea run, or is it gonna mate with whatever companion it can find? Um, so that's just an example of one thing. So more research is needed, you know. Um, and as I explained earlier, once a fish has moved in and they start to revert over to their stream colors for protection, um, based on you know living in that tan and colored water and their food, they you might catch it a week later um, and it's going to be a different color and you won't even know. So there's going to be some research by some groups at some point. I know a lot of universities um, are starting to get into this type of thing, especially with all the fish passage projects that are coming out. Um, so I guess the question is why protect them? Um, and again, I think it's because they're great fish and you know, just as important as any other fish that we're trying to protect at this point. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide again. <laughs> All right, another question. So is a brook trout a trout or a char? All right, we got some answers in here. So it is in fact a char. Um, it's kind of why I put a picture here, just because I want to make sure everybody believed me. <laughs> but you, you can see that this is an Arctic char from uh, Northern Canada, and yet it's got the same white markings on it, it's pectoral fins. Um, so yeah, even though we count it, call it a trout, it's in fact a char, which is kind of funny. Uh, same thing as how a brown trout is actually closely related to um, Atlantic salmon and you know which is kind of unique and um, they're in the same family and then um, rainbow trout is related to our Pacific salmon. Chris can you go to the next slide please? So this is my last slide so how can we help? Um, so first of all like anything educate yourself right? If this interests you and try to learn more um, people that fish really like to talk so you can go spend some time with them and they like to share uh, their stories and whatnot. They might not share their fishing spots, but they definitely like to talk. Um, you know, spread the word. If you think this is important, share your knowledge with people that weren't here today um, and beware of salters, right? Know where you can find them and how to identify them. Um, I, you know, I'm not gonna tell you or advise you on if you should target these fish or take them home from supper. But just remember what they're up against in the natural world. Um, you know, they don't need people taking them home either. So support habitat, restoration, dam removals, and fish passage. So there's a lot of great projects being taken in our area to help these fish. Uh, remember that the work that the community, the state, and the federal agencies are doing for stream passage is benefiting uh, these brook trout as well. And actually, Sai brought up the Snow Cove, um, Snow Brook project. That's a, that's a good area. Um, and that, that culvert will help these fish out quite a bit. Uh, and then try to get involved, right? So reach out to some local groups and help with research since there's still a lot that is unknown. Um, and I guess finally, you know, like I said, these trout are beneficiaries to the projects that are happening in the community. So I think you can add them in the list of fish that are, um, you know, getting benefited from it. So anyways, I guess I'll pass it along to Chris, thanks. Cool. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Sorry if there was a little delay there. It sounded, it sounded like there was on some of these slides, but uh, I was worried you... for a second. <laughs> What's that? I was worried my internet connection wasn't good and you couldn't hear me at all for a little bit. I was worried you thought I was dozing off or something. I mean, I, I was on it on my side, I think, but uh, yeah. no, no. So we are, we're good to go. I'm hoping you guys see Atlantic salmon now. Um, so Atlantic salmon, given my background working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, it's one of three endangered species here in the state. Uh, the other two, I'm sorry, 
three endangered fish species, anadromous fish species in the state. There's more endangered species in the state. Uh, so this is the one which Fish and Wildlife has the most jurisdiction over, actually, with the Endangered Species Act. I'll give you guys a little bit of background on that. So with the Endangered Species Act and fish, typically uh, the jurisdiction is shared by Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, so NIMS, the National Marine Fishery Service. And more likely than not, the fish jurisdiction, who gets control over the protection and those kind of things, is split at the tides. So the sturgeon are more covered by NOAA, and the Atlantic salmon is a really kind of strange scenario where we split jurisdiction. So Fish and Wildlife has from the tide up, and NOAA has from the tide out, so the sea marine survival, that side of things. So uh, anyway, that's just a little bit of background on as I go through some of the projects, it'll make sense why we work more on the habitat here in Maine. So that's some history. You can find them uh, throughout the state. You used to be able to find them throughout the Northeast. Go, I'll show a map shortly about that. Uh, I'll talk about their life cycle, what we can do to help them, especially here stateside. Uh, some quick facts about them. They have a pretty big migration. So you can find them, you can find Atlantic salmon anywhere from Connecticut River, or you could, from the Connecticut River, all the way through Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Ireland, as you work your way across, all the way to Russia. So the Atlantic salmon, you can find them in all those places, and the majority of them end up meeting in Greenland, the fish, uh, to eat, sorry, and grow into adults right off the coast of Greenland. So they have a pretty big migration. Uh, another fun fact about them is they're called the leaper. So Atlantic salmon, especially over in Europe, are known to jump 11 or 12 feet. So they have barriers, but they can definitely uh, take on those barriers, some of them. Uh, and so I'll show some scenarios here in a little bit. Something interesting about them compared to Pacific salmon is that not all of them die after they spawn. Uh, I think m the majority of Pacific salmon, that is the end of their life cycle, but some Atlantic salmon can spawn. They become Celts is what they're referred to as. And then they can go back out to sea and then come back again. So pretty unique in that manner. And then Alex had uh, this fun fact already. So the Atlantic salmon are actually more closely related to brown trout than they are to Pacific salmon. So I think I, until I started working with them, I didn't know that one. So I thought it was pretty interesting. So uh, question, in what main river, if I'm guessing if you guys are on the peninsula, you probably know this, but in what main river can you find the majority of returning Atlantic salmon today? And I can't, I figured out, I think with a shared screen, I can't have the chat box up at the same time. Uh, so if you, if you guys hit submit, go for it. And answers. Good. All right. I'll keep moving then. Yeah. So the Penobscot. So in Maine, uh, they used to be throughout New England, all the way down to the Connecticut River. Now you can mostly only find them in Maine. There might be a few strays a little further south. But the picture there is their critical habitat. Uh, they are now an endangered species. I think historically, talking numbers, I've read figures that there used to be up to like 1.5, 1.8 million returning salmon throughout North America. And that meant within Maine, there are hundreds of thousands that were returning in Maine. I'm talking before a lot of human interactions and damming rivers, some of those habitat uh, degradation. where we're talking a couple thousand are returning. So it got to the point that they became endangered, uh, listed as endangered in 2000, and then their critical habitat, which you see there, was listed in 2009. So I think I got another question after this. I do. So given the numbers that I just told you, I think the, the numbers are not quite where they used to be. How many Atlantic salmon returned to the Penobscot last year? And so the way I'm doing this, if you guess a number, get within 300 on either side, I think that qualifies as the right answer. You getting any guesses? Okay, all right, so I will share this answer now. So the answer is 1196. So anywhere from 896 to 1496, I'd say that's a pretty impressive guess. Um, 
the map that I have here, I use this in some reports, so this is, but this just shows the last 50 years uh, throughout Maine. So that light gray line is the Penobscot and its returns, and it's been trending upward more or less over the last decade, but you know, if you're thinking hundreds of thousands at some point, it's, it's not quite where it used to be. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea of where things have been over the past 50 years. The goal to delist salmon around here is to have 6,000 wild sustaining returning salmon. So that's in the critical habitat there as a total, it has 6,000. And so when I think of that number 1,200, I'm like, oh, that's not too bad. We're not that far off. But I think what I have to you always got to keep in mind is that the majority of these are actually hatchery of hatchery origin. So there are definitely some wild, some native and uh, wild bred, I guess, Atlantic salmon returning to where they grew up and the rivers that they were spawned in, but the majority are still coming from the hatchery system. And so there is still a ways to go. And there, I think that is, that's well known throughout the Atlantic salmon community. I think the timeline on the recovery, the ideally, you know, we make enough changes that it can happen is like 70 years, 75 years, I believe. So it's a long timeline for them, but I think the fact that they're holding on, it's a good thing. Um, speaking on their life history, so I'll start with two adults. So two adults typically return to the same river that they were spawning themselves. They lay some eggs, which are fertilized. They become fry and par in the freshwater. And then I mentioned that process of smultification when they get ready, go out to sea. They go out to sea for a little bit of time. I'm not being specific for a reason. And then they come back and they start the process over. Ideally, assuming they're not blocked or any of those things or they find some predators on the way. So that gets me to the next question is, what is the average age of a salmon who's returning to spawn the first time? All right, I will continue on. The answer to that is five, so five years old. Uh, there are some that come back a little early. They're known as grills, and then there are, of course, those, as I mentioned earlier, that can spawn, and then they don't die, and they can go back, but the average age is five. So question for endangered species perspective is what happened to them? Uh, big picture is habitat degradation, as both Cy and Alex mentioned for their species as well. Climate change more recently, marine survival is another big question. It's uh, kind of interesting that it's, is it still a big question kind of as Alex mentioned, there's still things we need to learn about these species, all the species that are on that list of 11 or 12 we have there. Um, so marine survival is a big question. More specifically, dams, uh, of course, blocking their habitat, especially main stem dams, I think, that one there is the VZ Dam, I believe. Um, so dams blocking habitat. Water quality, especially before the Clean Water Act, these need fresh cold water as well. Uh, harvest, there's a problem and ha well has been a problem. Not huge, not nearly the same extent now, but it has been in the past. Non-native species, invasives, which can compete with them and eat them, uh, can be a challenge. And then road crossings. I think every road crossing, which, which is not, I guess, too cover the full stream length, and I'll get into the details there in just a little bit. Any road crossing that is not to a certain standard can serve as a barrier. So how can we help? I'll get go big picture and then go nitty gritty on this. So big picture, this is a map of their migration, which I chatted about earlier. Um, there was recently an agreement within the last three or four years, a, a pact to slow down and limit the Greenland fishery for Atlantic salmon. Uh, of course, those are salmon from all over the North Atlantic, but includes Maine salmon. So I think it's kind of big pictures like this of how you're going to help the marine survival environment. I think what we found out is that that's not a huge percentage of the fish that were being caught were Maine salmon, but nonetheless, I think it's going to be efforts like this, which should make a large impact on their marine survival. Then a little closer to home, and I think this is where more fish and wildlife, at least my office, has been working is here at home. Uh, it's helping the migration. So talking about dams and dam removals, that is the start of the removal of the same dam I showed two slides ago. Um, so dam removals, of course, but sometimes dam re removals aren't always feasible at that time. Sometimes, it, or you just want to get action right away, you can build fish ladders, 
uh, elevators. There's actually up in Milford, there's a fish elevator, which if, if you can imagine uh, like a container on a semi truck, it's kind of like that. And it fills with water, fills with fish, lifts up and it lets the fish go on the other side. So it's kind of a cool concept. And then uh, this here, a ladder, which is in Damerscott. I believe this is for alewife. And I think any, I think, so I can correct me if I'm wrong, but I got to imagine that any ladder that's good for alewife is definitely good for salmon unless it's too little water. But I mean, it, those pools and that, that amount of barrier, you know, maybe six inches or something should not be a problem. Um, and the other one for trying to help the migration is bypasses. So I don't know, how many of you know about this, which is about 30, 45 minutes north of Bangor, but it's the Helen Bypass, which is, I believe it was constructed about five years ago. It's been in the works for a while, constructed about five years ago. It was a number of partners were involved, including Fish and Wildlife. And what they did is they essentially just built the river around the dam. So it opened up hundreds of miles of habitat. The scale of this is really impressive. It's fun to visit. It's about a thousand feet long, 200 a thousand feet long, 200 feet wide, and it opened up tons of habitat for all those fish species, those uh, that I listed earlier. Um, I think uh, tons of species can take advantage of something like this. So it was a really neat project. Kind of on a smaller scale, uh, this is closer to what I do. I work a lot more with culverts and bridges. I work specifically with our DOT, um, trying to improve habitat, especially road crossings. So. I, I'm really appreciative that I had that slide up there that showed the barriers because that is a great representation of all all of them that can be fixed or it can be improved. And of course, some of them are to that quality that we need now, but a lot of them can still be improved and help a lot of anadromous species. Um, so this is just a kind of representation of my work on a smaller scale. Ideally, if I came into a scenario and I saw a culvert like this one here on the left, I'd try and replace it with one here on the right which encompass, fully encompasses the stream. You have a natural stream bottom. You have banks. You have, uh, I think the size, is our size ideally is 1.2, the bankful width or bigger. Um, and so really this, the, the whole idea of it is to make sure that the fish don't even know a difference, that they're, that they're going under a road or leaving. They want it to the same velocities, the same slope, all the above, to just mimic the stream. So I'm going to do a little technical, uh, technical challenge here. I'm going to try and show a video, which I'm not too worried about the audio, but I want to try and show a video which shows construction of one of these new culverts showing in, in Sydney, Maine. So let's see if I can find this. Oh, this is where I'm going. Just a second here. Okay. All right, just a second. We might go without this one. Screen share. Can you guys see my Windows Explorer right now? Yeah, it's working. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Give it a go then. It is a time lapse, so it'll be a little choppy naturally. Cool. So that was a, uh, a year or two ago that's filled in since then. I'm going to 
Share it, go back to the presentation. We good to go? Sweet, thank you. Yeah, so that's just one representation of some of the work that we do. With DOT, we are, we're fortunate that they have been nice partners with us and working with us on a lot of these. We normally knock out maybe with them under our salmon. We have a salmon agreement with them, maybe 10 to 15 of these a year, which is, which is fun. Uh, I will show some more of these off. So although I work really with our DOT, we do have other biologists in our office who work with towns, municipalities, and private landowners to do similar work, trying to open up for various species, not just Atlantic salmon. So I just want to show off a couple around here. Uh, this one is in Surrey. I think the biggest thing that you would notice here, of course, beyond the size of the structure, is that when a structure is too small, if you're putting the same amount of water through that structure as opposed to the one next to it, the velocity can just exponentially increase. So you gotta imagine for certain species which aren't good swimmers, they're having a lot of trouble getting through there, even at normal velocities. And a good way to tell that too is if there's a big pool at the end of the culvert, the end of the structure, which it's gonna be a scour pool because the water just kind of came flowing through there faster than it would naturally. And so ideally when we put in these new structures, the scour pools will fill in naturally as material moves down the stream and it'll eventually realign itself and get back to more of a natural flow. So that's one picture here uh, in Surrey. This is one up in Winterport. It's similar to the Sydney one. It's not horrible. Uh, it, it's, it was a larger structure, maybe doesn't cover the full stream, but the same concept, even that something a little too small can really increase flows. And my final two ones to show off, these are a little more dramatic. This one's up in Eddington off of Route 46. Same concept. Uh, this was solid brook trout habitat, uh, I think. Met some guy up there said it was a brook trout factory uh, and you got to imagine that having a structure like this can only help them moving back and forth especially cold water habitat and this final one pretty dramatic right this one's right north of carriers uh in bucksport and the same thing I, it was blocked it was blocked on the on the uh inlet side and on the outlet side there's a pretty decent scour pool and for the most part i thought it was pretty small i would when i was helping dot in terms of what my thoughts on it were I didn't really expect too much. I thought it might be warmer water, especially because of the slope, but they pulled a bunch of brook trout out of here, which is encouraging knowing that they're putting in a structure like this. So wrapping it up, uh, we ch only chatted about three of the species. Obviously we could have chatted way longer, but alewife brookies and salmon are not the only anadromous uh, species around here. There are many of them and many of them are returning right now this time of year. So I, Alex hit these points a lot. How can you get involved? You can volunteer with local organizations. I think we're really lucky to have Maine Coast Heritage Trust, Blue Hill, Island Heritage Trust with access to some of these really cool properties on these streams and brooks and, and the ocean. Uh, and then of course, you can always fish for some of these species and I encourage catch and release. It, they are beautiful fish to see. Uh, you can check out the Alewife sites, Pierce Pond, Walker, Walker Pond, Patton Stream all around here. And then you can always go up not always, you can soon go back up to Craig Brook National Fish Hatchery and visit their visitor center. You can learn about Atlantic salmon and tons of other species around here. So that is wrapping it up and good for questions. Thank you so much, everybody. That was amazing. I just learned so much just now. Really delightful hour. Um, so I put in a little note saying that you can raise your virtual hand if you have questions or you can put a question in the chat box um, and the panelists can answer you. It looks like we have one raised hand. And do you, do you, would you like to ask a question? I'm going to allow you to talk if you would like to ask a question. I would like to make a comment if that's okay with you. Sure. I just, I just think this was a great presentation. And now I really know what my son is talking about when he babbles on about brook trouts and things of that nature. And I'm a very old lady, so you can always learn something new. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you. Um, Chris, we had a question earlier about where in Surrey that restructured passage was. Uh, we don't need this specific location, but just generally speaking. Yeah, I believe that was the Surrey Road, but don't hold me to that. So that was a, 
one of our fisheries biologists, Scott Craig, in our office was involved on that one. So that wasn't one I was involved with specifically, but mm -hmm. I also I can figure it out too if uh, if we want to get down to the coordinates of it. Awesome, thank you. Yep. So we have um, four more participants who have raised their hands. So I'm kind of just going to go in order here. Um, Bob has a question. If you would like to ask it now. Bob, would you still like to ask a question? If not, I'll, I'll move on to somebody else. It looks like he's muted. Yeah, on my screen, it's showing muted. Let's oh, see. Can you hear me now? Yes, so, uh, we can hear you. Hey, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, public access to Noise Pond, also called Norris Pond, the outlet of which is Peters Brook. I don't know of any. I don't think there isn't any Blue Hill Heritage Trust land there, and we don't have any. So I don't think there is yet. So any idea how to get a canoe in there? <laughs> um, let's see, a stream no. of Peters. I haven't, I don't know, you know, Leslie Clapp might know is what I'm thinking, Lander. Um, there are a couple avid canoeists around here who might have ideas. I don't have an answer to offer. Good question though. That is a great question. We could follow up with maybe checking in with Leslie Clapp or, or, or somebody else um, and seeing what we could find out and some, somehow sharing that. Is, is that. This is Bob Erickson, correct? This is he, yes. Okay, well, we'll see what we can do to find an answer for you. Thank you. All right, who else do we have here? Um, we have a hand raised from Alexandra. So I'm gonna unmute her. Hi. Um, what I, I think that somebody mentioned several other of the local groups that need volunteers. Can you list those groups again, please? Oh, sure. Um, the one that I think you would be best to reach out to is Trout Unlimited. Um, there's a main chapter and they have several um, coordinators throughout the state. Um, the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, that's based out of Cape Cod actually, um, which doesn't mean that they don't come up here and do work, but there's actually a pretty good uh, sea run brook trout population down on the Cape, which is kind of crazy to think about, but um, there's a National Wildlife Refuge down there. Um, so there's some protected land. So I would give Trout Unlimited, reach out to them um and maybe just do some digging in the university in maine i know that uh, there's a couple of research papers that have come out of there in the last year or two so everybody's always looking for some help um what i mean is uh i count with the surrey group but i wondered if there were other groups that need counters Oh, you're talking about yeah. Life. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I can, well, I can, you probably have more, Alex, but I'll give you an idea. The uh, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, what used to be called PERC down Stonington, they coordinate the volunteer counting on the alewife ponds around this peninsula. Um, so you might give them a call. Mike Talhauser is the name of the point person on those counts which are already underway. Uh, it's pretty fun to watch how many fish are coming up these days. Uh, what was that group again, please? Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Mike's always, sure. Mike's always looking for some help. So Allison has a question. Hello. Um, I appreciate you guys putting this all together. Um, our question is, uh, we live down in the Kittery area, so um, <clears throat> how would be the, a, a good opportunity for us to get involved uh, down in Southern Maine to 
help out with uh, watershed type opportunities and any information you have of some of the local rivers down here. Thank you. I don't know. Well, I'll start, although Chris, I'm guessing you have more information off of here because you're more statewide, but um, there are a couple of river restoration projects happening down there. I think that, you know, back to Alex and Chris's sort of list of partners, every one of these projects, even the tiny streams, have a list of partner organizations that's like 10 or 20 organizations long. Um, and that's how many it takes to get to each of these done. So um, easy contacts that, that might make sense to try is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and their local people down there. So the group that Chris and Alex work with. Um, there are a few land trusts down there that are working on restoration projects. Um, and I'd have to get back to you afterwards to sort of list those because you're getting outside of my region of uh, paying attention. <laughs> but I'd be happy to do that through Lander and Jake if helpful. And Chris, you might have something more to add. Yeah, a little bit. I, the, what comes to mind is the Saco River restoration talking about down in Southern Maine. Um, and of course, from a fish and wildlife perspective, anyone who wants to bomb, I think it's awesome that, I, as you said, that all these groups will accept volunteers with open, open arms. Uh, and there, I think every refuge, if there's a national wildlife refuge and a, a lot of fish hatcheries, which I know there's Nashua that's down, but it's northern New Hampshire, uh, they have friends groups, which will kind of, it's a nonprofit entity that's attached to the refuge or attached to uh, the hatchery that they do a lot of work and they're heavily involved with them. Yeah, um, and you have the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge in Wells. Um, they do a lot of salt marsh restoration and work with sparrows um, and a couple other fairly listed species. So you can reach out to them and it might not be fish related, but if you're just interested in helping out, um, they'd be a good contact point. And then also like, or, think organizations like uh, Nature Conservancy, um, you know, those NGOs that are across the country. I know there's a Nature Conservancy group in Brunswick um, that's kind of in between us, but you could reach out to them. They, they would do some fish work too. Thank you all. We have a question from Katie. Hi, I mute myself. Okay, here we go. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, first, I wanted to mention though, here in um, Orland at the Toddy Dam, there is an annual alewife count that's going on currently. There's a schedule on uh, online that people can sign up for 10 minute slots to go and count. Um, and if you want, I can give the person's name who's heading that up with their phone number. Would you like, should I do that now? Yes. That would be great. Okay. His, his name is Jake Meyer, M-A-I-E-R. And his phone number is 944-0033. So anyone in this area um, near Toddy and Alamusic um, might be interested. There are fish ladders on both of those dams. So my, my question to your group is, is the goal in your minds to eventually remove all dams, even those that are on relatively shallow water bodies that are used for community recreation and have fish ladders and also provide habitat for anadromous fish, um, such as the alewife. So I'm curious, because if the dam went out on Alamusic, for instance, um, we would lose that habitat for loons, for, uh, for the alewife, um, it would be very shallow indeed. So I'm just curious what, you're all, what you all think about the eventual goal of dam removal. I guess I'll, I'll start up, uh, with my person, this personal opinion. Um, of course, I, I think ladders, ladders, elevators, bypasses, these are all compromises. Uh, of course, I think ideally from a fish perspective, they, they want the, the streams the way they were uh, for millennia as preferred. Um, but of course, that's why ladders and elevators and whatnot exist too, because there are other considerations, especially within the community, 
And so uh, there's a balance. Every situation is unique when it comes to the dams. And I, and I saw another question about deadbeat dams. And again, if they're not serving any function anymore and there's not an energy function or anything like that, and there's aren't any supporters or reasons to keep it up, then yeah, go for it. But of course, there's always a balance. Right. Thank you. Lander, you're muted. Sorry, everybody. Um, thanks, Alex. So we have a question from John. I'm going to unmute him now. Hi, uh, I've been involved with the uh, alewife count in Soamsville for a number of years. And uh, historically, in the last five years, I'd say there have been like, oh, maybe 25,000 to 30,000 alewives every year. And last year, it was down to about 7,000, which uh, I'm not exactly sure what to attribute that to, maybe water temperature. But um, I was interested in trying to find out uh, alewife counts in other parts of the state of Maine. And I found that information very difficult to uh, um, get a handle on, including uh, I think I talked to Catherine Schmidt over at uh, the Island Institute or the no, Skudik Institute. And she said that that information was really difficult to come by. But it seems to me that if people are going to bother to count fish, that somebody ought to be keeping track of how many fish are going where and how we're doing with the restoration efforts. Yeah, so Maine Department of Marine Resources is who receives that information. Um, I don't know why it's sort of hard to get at or how to get it. I haven't ever tried to look at statewide numbers over time, but that's who it needs to be submitted to. Um, and then usually the local groups like yours are keeping track and trying to get the word out there um, about the numbers that come in each year. So um, it may well be hard to find, but it is being collected and it's, it, it is out there. It just seems to me that it doesn't make a lot of sense to bother to count something unless people are keeping track of it to see how the count is going. That's right. No, they're keeping pretty close track. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, too. It was great. Linder, do we have any more raised hands? It looks like we have a couple of raised hands, um, but I can't, I think they were people who already asked questions. So if you had a, if you have another question, um, if you'd like to raise your hand again, um, maybe put a little note in the chat box. Let's see. Um, I guess I, I'll unmute Anne again. It looks like her hand is raised again. I'm not sure if it was from the past question or this one. We'll find out. Let's see. Anne, do you have another question? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any more questions in the chat box? Looks like we've covered them all. Does it appear so on your end? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I think we're I think we're good. So maybe a, a final thank you to our presenters this afternoon. You all were wonderful. Um, I want to piggyback on what Lander said earlier. I learned so much. This has been amazing. So thank you all for your time. Um, if there's any questions that for some reason weren't answered, please feel free to reach out to Lander or myself. Um, you can find both of our contacts um, at both of our home websites, Landers being at Blue Hill Heritage Trust, mine being at islandheritagetrust.org. Um, we encourage you all to tune in again next Thursday at four o'clock. Um, we're going to be sharing some more um, wonderful webinars all the way through June. So stay tuned and thank you again to our participants. Thank you so much, Jake. And yes, I echo that. Thank you so much for being here. Right. Well, with that, I think, Lander, shall we, shall we call it good? 
Well, right. yeah. All right. Thank have you. Have a great night, everybody. Everyone have a good evening. Thanks, you guys. Bye.